folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatora, and so here we have the Windless Oakshot Type 14 sword, which I'm going to be reviewing in this video. I'll try and keep things as concise as possible. So first of all, a lot of you watching this video will be familiar with Windless. Windless have been around, I'd say, a long time, literally since the Second World War, um, and uh, they were, during the Second World War, making uh, cookeries for the British Army and Indian Army, and um, they essentially in modern times have branched into uh, sword making. They make uh, military regulation swords, um, and they make swords for lots of other people, and they make swords under their own name as well. Windless are known for making uh, reasonable quality um, but affordable swords. So the comparing like with like, the price point that they're coming in at um, is, is really quite reasonable for um, what you're getting for that price. But not only talking about for the price, how is it as a sword? Well, I'm going to dispense with the scabbard pretty much straight away, and I'll talk a little bit about the scabbard towards the end of this video. Now, let's really have a look at the sword itself, which is obviously the main bit that people are paying for and are interested in. Now, over the years, this Type 14 has been around for many, many years, actually, and um, has received generally favourable reviews. Um, it's generally regarded as really good value for money, and I wouldn't disagree with that at all. In fact, I wouldn't disagree with basically the average of what you'll find online for reviews of this sword. It's really good value for money, and it's a nice sword. It handles nicely, um, and it does everything that you'd expect from a Type 14. Now, just very, very briefly, what is Type 14? What am I referring to here? Well, for anyone who doesn't know, Ewart Oakshot was a, um, someone who made a typology for medieval straight double-edged swords, and the Type 14 is one of those types. This type of sword was particularly around in the 13th and 14th centuries. So this type of sword in use in medieval Europe would have usually been intended to be coupled with either a shield, a heater shield for the most part, or um, in the civilian world, or if it was carried by um, archers or billmen or this kind of people, then uh, with a buckler. So a lot of people use Type 14s when they're practicing something like I-33 or 133 sword and buckler technique. Um, and frankly, actually an outline, if we ignore the details of the Type 14 for a minute, in outline, it's not dissimilar from swords you find in the 15th century as well. Although this, the particular details of uh, this fuller and the Type 14, um, where it sits in the typology, had more or less been replaced by other types in the 15th century. So it's more of a kind of 13th, 14th century, particularly 14th century sword. Um, and this was used by all different types of um, soldier, everyone from knights who would obviously have more expensive and in some cases um, decorated more fancy versions, all the way down to, um, you know, typical kind of spearmen and archers and crossbowmen and people like this. So this is a type of sword that anybody who's interested in the 14th century, for example, the Hundred Years' War, um, absolutely this could sit within, particularly the earlier 14th century. Um, they were still around in the later 14th century, but they were gradually being replaced by um, Type 15s and Type 18s and things like this, uh, Type 17s. But um, particularly in the first half of the 14th century, so the early part of the Hundred Years' War, um, and for example, the uh, Scottish Wars of Independence with William Wallace and Robert the Bruce, that kind of period. So we're talking around 1300 to 1350, particular, particularly being the hotspot for this Type 14. And really anyone interested in that period, as I say, this is a very good general purpose arming sword. Now, it is relatively uh, short, um, but it's not super, super short. Let's have a little look at its statistics for a second. So this sword I've just um, weighed on my digital scales, which I use for posting swords around the world. Um, so they're very accurate. And this is exactly 1165, 1165 um, grams, 1165 grams. Um, so that is uh, not heavy. Um, and it's not particularly light either. Uh, it's probably fairly representative of uh, quite a lot of these uh, Type 14s that were around in the 14th century, but equally there are lots that are lighter than this. So I would say that this is possibly slightly on the heavier end of the spectrum, and there is one reason for that that I will come back to in a minute. Um, but that's not to say that this is an overweight sword or a heavy sword. It is of historical parameters. It is just at the slightly heavier end of the spectrum. That being said, um, let's just have a little look at its length for a second. So the blade, 
Um, you can see it's not a particularly long sword, um, but the blade is um, 66 centimeters or 26 inches, that is. Okay, so that is, some people might refer to that as a short sword, but it's not really a short sword in a medieval arming sword context. That's pretty much a, again, the shorter end of the spectrum for arming swords at that time. But it is a short-ish sword, um, but it's certainly of the length that could quite plausibly be used by a knight as an arming sword, or uh, could be used with a buckler by an archer or whoever. But I wouldn't quite call it a short sword, but it is going in that direction. So it is a little bit on the heavy side for its size. That being said, it doesn't feel heavy in the hand. I mean, you can move the thing around really uh, pretty damn quickly. Um, and that's because uh, the weight distribution on it is very nice. Now, a lot of people focus on point of balance. And as I mentioned in many of my videos, actually point of balance or center of gravity is only slightly indicative of how a sword will handle um, because you can have equal weights at two ends of a barbell and it will balance in the middle. <laughs> However, when you try to move that thing, it will have a lot of rotational inertia because the weight is distributed at the ends of the object and not in the middle. That is the opposite in the case of these types of tapering blade that we see in the medieval period because in this case, let's put the um, tape down for a second, in this case, a lot of the mass is concentrated around here. So actually it's concentrated around the direction that you're gonna be rotating and turning the sword. So it actually has quite um, a small rotational inertia in that it still hits with a, uh, quite a lot of authority, but you can, you can move the thing around quickly because there's a lot of mass in the center of this and not a lot of mass at the end up here. It's also aided, of course, by this very nicely formed um, disc pommel, um, which um, aids with the, with the balance, of course. Um, and it's got a nicely formed and quite sturdy steel guard, as you can see. Now, let's have a little talk about how this particular example is made. So um, first things first, my golden rules, if you look on the Matt Easton website, you can find what my, my golden rules of sword replication are. Um, it, it complies well with a lot of those, okay? So uh, looking up the flat of the blade, this is hand forged incidentally. The blade is 1065 carbon steel, heat treated to roughly 50 Rockwell hardness. So it's a fairly hard blade. Um, I have cut with this already and we're gonna have a little bit of look at cutting later in this video. Um, it, and it seems to be fairly hard blade. I haven't um, hit other steel with it. Um, but it seems to have good flex, good heat treatment. The blade is, um, you can see that it's been forged. It has some rippling if we look along the flats of the blades. If we look along the edges, the edges are not uh, bendy. They are not twisted or warped. They are perfectly in line, both edges, no issues at all. Uh, the fuller is well ground and it does run all the way into the hilt as most medieval swords should do. It doesn't stop before we get to the hilt. So it runs all the way in. So it's of the correct historical form. Uh, it, it finishes quite nicely. It doesn't have any kind of abrupt or irregular grinding. In terms of the um, bevels uh, between the flat and the fuller, I would say that they're a little bit rounded. Um, this is often the case with um, hand forged blades that are then heavily ground and polished afterwards. It removes a degree of definition. So there is not a very sharp definition between the fuller and the flats. Uh, however, that is the case with lots of antique and original blades as well. It's just that if you look at higher end swords, and again, we're gonna talk about price point here. If you look at more expensive swords, usually you will find that will be one of the things that will mark out to your eyes a more expensive blade will be that there will be a more defined d line uh, between the fuller and the flat of the blade in general. However, as I say, a lot of originals are actually like this. Uh, so that's not to say that modern high-end replicas are always representative of the original medieval swords because they're often not. They're often more defined and more clinical in a way than the original medieval swords. Um, so just something to be aware of anyway. Now let's talk about the actual edge bevels. So one thing about windlass swords is most of their models, um, most of their models of sword are essentially made as blunt swords but they're not like reenactment blunt swords they are just not 
made to be sharp from the outset. So this does have a secondary bevel. So when you order most windlass swords, they will have a second, if you order them sharp, which is I think what most people buy windlass swords for these days is sharps for cutting, test cutting, um, or solo training, um, you will find that they have a secondary bevel on them. Now, one point of criticism that I would raise um, to these, and this connects to the mass or weight issue, is that I believe that the primary market in the modern world for these swords is uh, cutting, is people who want a sharp sword for cutting. And so I believe that this blade could be better by being made sharp from the outset with a single bevel. So that is, if I just put down the sword for a second, that is the edges come from uh, the centre of the blade here, if you imagine you've got the fillers, up directly to the edge. And this is how most, not all, but this is how most medieval European sword edges are formed. They are either a direct um, bevel to the edge, okay, so just one single bevel, like a chisel, or they are hollow ground, so they actually uh, bow inwards and then come to a finer edge, okay? And what we don't usually see with metal, medieval swords is them coming to almost an edge and then have a, having a secondary bevel in the final bit. What I would say is, for the price point that these are at, that's still not a major problem and they will still cut well. You've got to remember that a lot of swords in history and in different cultures, for example, Indian swords, do have secondary bevels. So a secondary bevel can still cut well. Uh, it's not that this will necessarily be a, a worse cutter for having a secondary bevel. It's just that it's not medieval European saws don't usually have that second bevel. They do occasionally, but they don't usually. One way you can improve this, incidentally, if you get one of these swords, uh, and they are very good value for money, so I wouldn't in any way discourage you from getting one. In fact, um, these this is a very good option if you want to type 14 is when you've got it, get order it sharp, and you can actually reduce the effects of the secondary bevel by apple seeding the edge uh, with some further um, sharpening of yourself. So instead of having one angle, then a second angle for the main bevel of the blade and then the final edge, you can actually round off that shoulder, as it were, and turn it into an apple seed edge. And this would equally be uh, historically accurate for these kinds of swords. And it is a very strong edge, a very reinforced edge. It's stronger than the direct bevel. It's stronger than the hollow grinding. That will also reduce a little bit of mass, although it's such a small amount of mass, I'm not sure that you would notice a difference. So the two reasons why I think that these should be made with the single bevel is number one, it's historically correct for this type of sword. Number two, um, it's uh, it, it means that you're reducing some mass, okay? It means that the blades would be a little bit lighter. And I think that this could be an even better sword if it was made slightly lighter. Right, I'm not going to linger any longer on the edge point. I think I've probably made myself clear. So in terms of fit and finish, so we've talked mostly about the blade. The polish is nice. It is a uh, high mirror polish, but it has the looks of a hand uh, mirror polish. It's not so high that it looks like a kind of um, factory made stainless steel or anything like that. It's, it's probably what was um, authentic to a lot of period swords. It's better than a satin polish. And I criticize some high end makers for having a satin finish when I think they should have better than a satin finish. So this is better than a satin finish um, and it's nicely done. So I, I like the blade. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about distal taper in a second, but I'll just carry on talking about the uh, rest of the construction. Everything is tight and solid. If I bang the sword, if I wiggle the sword, everything is tight. There's no movement in the pommel, no movement in the guard. Um, I can, um, you don't really get a ring when you do this. And I, that seems to be because of the way that the grip is mounted. I don't know why, um, but you don't really get a, a, a ring in the blade. It is peened at the end, so completely historically accurate. And the Tang is a one-piece construction. There's no welding in there. There's no rods. There's in this one. There's no thread or anything like that. It is a one piece with the blade comes through and is peened or riveted at the end of the pommel. Historically accurate. Um, the grip is wood, obviously, with leather over the top. It is stitched up the back. Um, historically accurate. It's not the most um, high-end way of making a grip. Usually, you'd put cord and then you'd have leather wrap over the top. This is just leather over wood, but that is also done historically. That's not unhistorical, that is historically accurate. And 
um, it is of course a it saves some cost on the end product as well obviously if you got one of these and you wanted to work on it and bling it essentially you could upgrade the grip wrap if you wanted to you could replace a whole grip if you wanted to but the basic components are good one little thing to note uh, it's a strange thing I've noticed with all of the windlasses I've looked at is if we just zoom in here for a second you can see the aperture for the blade it does sit very nicely into the guard but they use a parallel edged um, uh, kind of grind or, or um, machine to take out a groove in the center of the guard here so it's not exactly shaped to the base of a blade now that actually saves cost because there it's easier to cut out a channel it's not really historically accurate in that usually the slot not always, I have to say. There are examples in the Museum of London where this isn't the case, but usually the slot would be the same shape as the cross section of the blade. In other words, it would be a, like a flattened diamond shape, and it would so the the guard would sit closer to the edges. Um, in this case, it doesn't. It doesn't really bother me, um, and I can see why they've done it because, in machining terms, it's easier to do that. The main thing is that the blade does sit into the guard, and some. Um, some more affordable manufacturers the blade won't actually go into the guard like that so you know full kudos to windlass for actually doing that so it seats in there um, right okay I said I'd talk a little bit about distal taper so one of the things that is lacking on a vast numbers of a very large proportion of shall we say affordable or uh, you know economy priced swords functional swords is a lack of distal taper and I have to say in the case of this particular sword there isn't much much distal taper but in reference to some styles of blade there wasn't historically always very much distal taper and as it happens one of those types of blade that we don't see an awful lot of distal taper on are these medieval blades which taper a lot in the profile in the silhouette so if they're very broad at the base here and get narrower and narrower Often if we look at the originals, they don't have much distal taper in this direction. And that, of course, is because it's to do with weight distribution and stiffness. And it's to do with the amount of metal here versus the amount of metal here versus the amount of metal here. And quite simply, if your blade is very broad, you don't need it to be very thick. And not only do you not need it to be very thick for stiffness, because you're getting the stiffness from the width. Additionally, you don't want it to be very thick because that would make it too heavy. Um, so actually it's about having the right amount of metal here, here and here and it doesn't really matter whether you taper it this way or whether you taper it that way or you taper it in both directions which is often the case. Um, so in terms of this sword it's actually got, it flexes in a nice way, it's quite stiff at the base of the blade because it's broad. I'm having to be slightly careful because this is a relatively sharp blade. You can see it flexes mostly in the second half of the blade but it's stiff, it is a stiff blade. So I can push it into my wooden post here and flex it and it doesn't flex I mean it flexes it's got good flex good temper but it, it's difficult to flex it is a stiff blade so very good for thrusting it's got a lot of authority in the cut as well a slight bit on the heavy side and I would prefer the edges to be a single bevel instead of having a secondary bevel in an ideal world in other words I think the windlass should make these as sharps from the outset but the hilt, very nice, nice construction. It's simple, but it looks right. I might possibly, if I want to nitpick, I might have tapered the cross guard off at the ends a bit. It looks a little bit bar-like. It looks a little bit thick at the ends. And I personally, if you look at, again, if you look at higher end swords, if these were tapered down a bit, it would reduce the mass slightly again. Um, it would reduce the mass, and I think it would give a slightly more refined look. So uh, to summarise, um, I'm quite impressed, in fact, by this Type 14. It's nice. It's very nice. I'll be keeping this. It's a lovely little sword and it is fun to cut with. I'm going to go out and cut some more so you guys can see. Um, I highly recommend it for the price. I think, it's, I think it's really good value. And it's also a very nice potential project sword. If you want to do a little bit of... Um, modification this is actually a really good basis for it it's a good affordable basis for it you can put a better edge on here you can do uh, you can apple seed that edge or reduce a bit of mass make it sharper make it a better cutter you could possibly taper these um, quillons you could maybe put some detailing on the end of the quillons you could change the grip if you wanted to um, you could put ribs or bands on it or you could do a cord wrap or whatever you like um, and it has the look 
of the originals. It looks right. If you put this next to an original Type 14 in a museum cabinet, it would look like a respectable replica of one. So um, I would say a, a good solid effort from Windlass here and I like this Type 14 a lot. Now before I go and do some cutting with this I did say, there's my buckler, I did say that I would talk about the scabbard briefly. So first of all brilliant that it has a scabbard. I love the fact that you're getting an affordable sword which frankly would be worth the money without a scabbard but you're getting a scabbard with it and I do think that high-end manufacturers that don't give scabbards. I think it's scandalous because it doesn't cost that much money to make a simple scabbard. Um, and especially if you're selling sharp swords, if you're storing sharp swords around in the house, I think that any sharp sword should have a scabbard to protect the edges. Not all my sharp swords do because getting scabbards separately made is expensive business. So I keep them in boxes, but I think it's brilliant that they supply a scabbard. Now, the leather is nice. Uh, it's stiff, it's not wood lined, so it's not historically accurate really. It's not inaccurate, but most medieval scabbards were wood lined with leather over the top. But it is stiff leather, it looks the part. I don't like these, okay? So these big locket uh, plates, um, I think they don't look historically accurate and they don't need to be there. So most medieval scabbards don't have this type of mount at the top. This is a later period thing. They do have a chape at the bottom and I have no issues with the chape at all. The chape's nicely formed and it's tight. My opinion is the locket is, doesn't fit great. It's a little bit too big. It just looks like a big piece of um, bent steel and I think it cheapens the look of the scabbard. So I actually think that Windlass should get rid of these and just keep the leather at the top. Just have leather with a chape. Okay, so there we go. I hope that's some useful feedback. I'm going to go outside now and I hope you enjoy seeing me put this through its paces, chopping various things.
hopefully that's demonstrated that the, this little sword uh, is pretty reliable. It's not it's not picked up any um, edge deformations or curls or anything like that. You wouldn't expect that obviously from, certainly from bottles, but uh, hopefully not from wood either, but no uh, loss of edge or anything like that here. Uh, no marks on the edge or nicks, no uh, bends or twists or anything untoward like that. Nothing, nothing's come loose in the hilt. It's all nice and solid still. So uh, it cuts with quite a lot of authority. Where this sword falls down is it's not terribly sharp. You'll notice that this is a sharp edge that I'm happy to run my fingers up and down. So it's not really sharp. It's not really what I would call sharp. Um, I do understand that some manufacturers say, oh, well, this is historical sharp. Well, it's not really. It might be historical sharp, sharp to how some antiques have survived, but it's not how they would have been originally. Um, so uh, this needs to be sharper. But I, as always, I always want to review and demonstrate swords as they come to me, not after I've done things to them. Um, and I will definitely make this sharper. I will also, when I get time, apple seed the edge. Once more, I would conclude um, that the main thing to say about this sword is really that it would benefit from being made as a sharp from the outset um, and have a single bevel and have a sharper edge. Um, that being said, this is a tremendous sword for the value, uh, for, for the money. And if I had, obviously I got the, sent, sent this as a sample to, to review and test. Um, so, um, but I will definitely be keep, keeping this because it's just a really nice sword and it's nicely representative of the type. It looks historical. It's got some of the key things that other manufacturers, um, certainly of more affordable swords get wrong. This one's got right. It's nice and solid. I can trust it. It's um, all a solid, good construction and it's fun. It's fun to cut with. So um, there we go. Check the link below uh, if you want to um, maybe uh, look to adding one of these to your collection. It's a nice little thing. It's not a lot of money for what you get. Um, it's good sword, good fun to cut with. I would only say once again those couple of uh, constructional comments I would say uh, to Windless about improving this even more. But principally, if people want this as a cutting sword, bear in mind it's not going to come to you tremendously sharp, at least mine didn't. It's sharp enough to cut bottles, as you saw, um, but it's not as sharp as you'll probably want it. And it could have a better edge geometry if they manufactured them in a slightly different way even if they just came to a very fine edge that what didn't quite have the final sharpen and then that was just added on customers uh, request anyway thank you very much for watching check out the link below give us a like and a subscribe and i'll be back with more reviews of other swords including more windless swords really soon um, so make sure you subscribe and i'll see you back here on scholar gladiatorio channel really soon cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.